Aristippus of Cyrene too had left off in suspense of judgment as to what might really lie behind Flamantia Murnia Mundi, the flaming ramparts of the world, those strange, bold, skeptical surmises which had haunted the minds of the first Greek inquirers as merely abstract doubt which had been present to the mind of Heraclitus as one element only in a system of abstract philosophy, became with Aristippus a very subtly practical worldly wisdom. The difference between him and those obscure earlier thinkers is almost like that between an ancient thinker generally and a modern man of the world. It was the difference between the mystic in his cell or the prophet in the desert and the expert cosmopolitan administrator of his dark scenes, translating the abstract thoughts of the master into terms, first of all, of sentiment. It has been sometimes seen in the history of the human mind that when thus translated into terms of sentiment, of sentiment as lying already halfway towards practice, the abstract ideas of metaphysics for the first time reveal their true significance. The metaphysical principle, in itself, as it were, without hands or feet, becomes impressive, fascinating, of effect, when translated into a precept as to how it were best to feel and act, in other words, under its sentimental or ethical equivalent. The leading idea of the great master of Cyrene his theory that things are but shadows, and that we, even as they, never continue in one state, might indeed have taken effect as a languid, nervating, consumptive nihilism, as a precept of renunciation, which would touch and handle and busy itself with nothing. But in the reception of metaphysical formulae, all depends, as regards their actual and ulterior result, on the pre-existing qualities of that soil of human nature into which they fall, the company they find already present there, on their admission into the house of thought, there being at least so much truth as this involved in the theological maxim, that the reception of this or that speculative conclusion is really a matter of will. The persuasion that all is vanity with this happily constituted Greek, who had been a genuine disciple of Socrates and reflected, presumably, something of his blitheness in the face of the world, his happy way of taking all chances generated neither frivolity nor sourness, but induced, rather, an impression just serious enough of the call upon men's attention of the crisis in which they find themselves. It became the stimulus towards every kind of activity and prompted a perpetual, inextinguishable thirst after experience. With Marius, then, the influence of the philosopher of pleasure depended on this, that in him an abstract doctrine, originally somewhat acrid, had fallen upon a rich and genial nature, well fitted to transform it into a theory of practice, of considerable stimulative power towards a fair life. What Marius saw in him was the spectacle of one of the happiest temperaments coming, so to speak, to an understanding with the most depressing of theories, accepting the results of a metaphysical system which seemed to concentrate into itself all the weakening traits of thought in earlier Greek speculation and making the best of it, turning its hard, bare truths with wonderful tact into precepts of grace and delicate wisdom and a delicate sense of honour. Given the hardest terms, supposing our days are indeed but a shadow, even so, <laughs> we may well adorn and beautify in scrupulous self-respect our souls and whatever our souls touch upon. These wonderful bodies, these material dwelling places through which the shadows pass together for a while, the very raiment we wear, our very pastimes and the intercourse of society. The most discerning judges saw in him something like the graceful humanities of the later Roman and our modern culture as it is termed, while Horace recalled his sayings as expressing best his own consummate amenity in the reception of life. In this way, for Marius, under the guidance of that old master of decorous living, those eternal doubts as to the criteria of truth reduced themselves to a scepticism almost dryly practical, a scepticism which developed the opposite position between things as they are and our impressions and thoughts concerning them, the possibility, if an outward world really does exist, of some faultiness in our apprehension of it. The doctrine, in short, of what is termed the subjectivity of knowledge. That is a consideration, indeed, which lies as an element of weakness, like some admitted fault or flaw at the very foundation of every philosophical account of the universe, which confronts all philosophies at their starting, but which none have really dealt conclusively. Some perhaps not quite sincerely, which those who are not philosophers dissipate by common but unphilosophical sense, or by religious faith. The peculiar strength of Marius was to have apprehended this weakness on the threshold of human knowledge in the whole range of its consequences. And knowledge is limited to what we feel, he reflected. We need no proof that we feel, but can we be sure that things are at all like our feelings? Mere peculiarities in the instruments of our cognition, like the little knots and waves on the surface of a mirror, may distort the matter they seem to represent. Of other people, we cannot truly know even the feelings, nor how far they would indicate the same modifications, each one of a personality really unique, in using the same terms as ourselves. 
That common experience, which is sometimes proposed as a satisfactory basis of certainty, being after all only a fixity of language. But our own impressions, the light and heat of that blue veil over our heads, the heavens spread out, perhaps not like a curtain over anything. How reassuring, after so long a debate about the rival criteria of truth, to fall back upon direct sensation, to limit one's aspirations after knowledge to that. In an age still materially so brilliant, so expert in the artistic handling of material things, with sensible capacity still in undiminished vigour, with the whole world of classic art and poetry outspread before it, and where there was more than eye or ear could well take in, how natural determination to rely exclusively upon the phenomena of the senses, which certainly never deceive us about themselves, about which alone we can never deceive ourselves. And so the abstract apprehension that the little point of this present moment alone really is between a past which has just ceased to be and a future which may never come became practical with Marius, under the form of a resolve, as far as possible, to exclude regret and desire and yield himself to the improvement of the present with an absolutely disengaged mind. America is here and now, here or nowhere, as Wilhelm Meister finds out one day, just not too late after so long looking vaguely across the ocean for the opportunity of the development of his capacities. It was as if, recognising in perpetual motion the law of nature, Marius identified his own way of life cordially with it, throwing himself into the stream, so to speak, he too must maintain a harmony with the soul of motion in things by constantly renewed mobility of character. Omnis aristipum decuit colla et status et res. Thus Horace had summed up that perfect manner in the reception of life attained by his old Cyrenaic master, and the first practical consequence of the metaphysic which lay behind that perfect manner had been a strict limitation, almost the renunciation, of metaphysical inquiry itself. Metaphysic, that art, as it has so often proved in the words of Michel, Disagere avec méthode, bewildering oneself methodically, one must spend little time upon that. In the school of Cyrene, great as was its mental incisiveness, logical and physical speculation, theoretic interests generally, had been valued only so far as they served to give a groundwork, an intellectual justification to that exclusive concern with practical ethics, which was a note of the Cyrenaic philosophy. How earnest and enthusiastic, how true to itself, under how many varieties of character have been the great effort of the Greeks after theory, theoria, that vision of a wholly reasonable world, which, according to the greatest of them, literally makes man like God. How loyally they had still persisted in the quest after that, in spite of how many disappointments. In the Gospel of St. John, perhaps, some of them might have found the kind of vision they were seeking for, but not in doubtful disputations concerning being and not being, knowledge and appearance. Men's minds, even young men's minds, at that late day, might well seem oppressed by the wariness of systems which had so far outrun positive knowledge, and in the mind of Marius, as in that old school of Cyrene, the sense of ennui, combined with appetites so youthfully vigorous, brought about reaction, a sort of suicide, instances of the like have been seen since, by which a great metaphysical acumen was devoted to the function of proving metaphysical speculation impossible or useless. Abstract theory was to be valued only just so far as it might serve to clear the tablet of the mind from suppositions no more than half realizable or wholly visionary, leaving it in flawless evenness of surface to the impressions of an experience concrete and direct. To be absolutely virgin towards such experience, by ridding ourselves of such abstractions as are but the ghosts of bygone impressions, to be rid of the notions we have made for ourselves, and that so often only misrepresent the experience of which they uh, profess to be, the representations. Idola, idols, false appearances, as Bacon calls them later. To neutralize the distorting influence of metaphysical system by an all accomplished metaphysic skill, it is this bold, hard, sober recognition under a very dry light of its own proper aim, in union with a habit of feeling which on the practical side may perhaps open a wide doorway to human weakness that gives to the Cyrenaic doctrine, to reproductions of this doctrine in the time of Marius or in our own, their gravity and importance. It was a school to which the young man might come, eager for truth, expecting much from philosophy, in no ignoble curiosity, aspiring after nothing less than an initiation. He would be sent back, sooner or later, to experience, to the world of concrete impressions, to things as they may be seen, heard, felt by him, but with a wonderful machinery of observation, and free from the tyranny of mere theories. So, in intervals of repose, after the agitation which followed the death of Flavian, the thoughts of Marius ran, while he felt himself as if returned to the fine, clear, peaceful light of that pleasant school of healthfully sensuous wisdom in the brilliant old Greek colony, on its fresh upland by the sea. 
Not pleasure, but a general completeness of life was the practical ideal to which this anti-metaphysical metaphysic really pointed, and towards such a full or complete life, a life of various yet select sensation, the most direct and effective auxiliary must be, in a word, insight, liberty of soul, freedom from all partial and misrepresentative doctrine, which does but relieve one element in our experience at the cost of another, freedom from all embarrassment alike of regret for the past and of calculation on the future. This would be pre preliminary to the real business of, edu of education. Insight, insight through culture into all that the present moment holds in trust for us as we stand so briefly in its presence. From that maximum of life as the end of life followed as a practical consequence, the desirableness of refining all the instruments of inward and outward intuition, of developing all their capacities, of testing and exercising oneself in them, till one's whole nature became one complex medium of reception towards the vision, the beatific vision, if we really cared to make it such, of our actual experience in the world. Not the conveyance of an abstract body of truths or principles would be the aim of the right education of oneself or of another, but the conveyance of an art, and art in some degree peculiar to each individual character, with the modifications, that is, due to its special constitution and the peculiar circumstances of its growth, inasmuch as no one of us is like another, all in all.